saints, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Minister Robbie, but you can call me Robbie. And I'm Minister Beth. And this is Cyber Sunday School for Mount Calvary Community Church for January the 24th. We'll be studying from the Precept for Living book, and today's lesson is called Called as the Intercessor. And by the end of this lesson, we will explore Jesus' intercessory prayer for his disciples. Long for Jesus' prayer to be answered more fully in their lives and the church and pray for others and work for unity in the body of Christ. But before we begin today's lesson, we will begin as we begin each day in a word of prayer. Father God, we call upon you in the name of our Savior Christ Jesus, thanking you for another day, Father, for another beat of our hearts, for another breath in our lungs, for another opportunity to share your word with others, Father. We pray that you remove us out the way and speak through us as well as to us, Father, that all of the hearers may be blessed by the words that you have put in our, in our hearts, Father. We give you honor, glory, and praise by faith in the name of our Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And uh, today, as I said, it's called, the lesson is called Called as the Intercessor. And an intercessor is a go-between. Um, someone, uh, I have a cousin in Alabama, and I need an intercessor to speak to her, like AT&T or Sprint, someone that I can connect with her with. That's what we have for God. Our intercessor is Christ Jesus, our high priest. And we're going to learn today how he was also an intercessor for his disciples. He said an intercessory prayer, and he is doing the same for us on the right hand of God right now. But we're going to start with the in focus story, which is a story that helps us to relate to the, to the lesson in today's terms. And that will be read by the beautiful Minister Beth. The idea came from a pamphlet Anthony picked up somewhere called The Power of 30 Days. The pamphlet presented a simple way to deal with problems and trials we all face. Choose a prayer partner, and every day for 30 days, you and your partner come together in prayer and present the need to God. Anthony discussed the idea with his wife, and they agreed to come together each day and pray that God would do something about the drug house on the corner of their block. As they prayed, they continued to raise awareness of the problem among the neighbors and village officials. They knew God would provide the perfect solution and dangerous activities that the house promoted. Three weeks into their prayer vigil, the drug house burned down. No one was hurt, but the building was burned down. So the city had to demolish the remaining structure. Anthony and his wife were so overjoyed with the results of their prayer experiment that they shared the news with their church. Soon others were joining the power of 30-day prayers and many people were reporting miraculous results. In the cases where God had not yet moved, the participants reported a renewed vitality in their prayer lives. Some people who previously did not pray often had started praying regularly. The text question proses, prayer does in fact change things. When we communicate our love, gratitude, and needs to our Heavenly Father, He is moved to act on our behalf. In today's lesson, we will examine Jesus' high priestly prayer for his followers. Amen. Thank you. So, um, there was a lot that, um, in that story that I really liked, particularly uh, 30 days prayer. Uh, how they got together with uh, the power of 30 days, where they would get together with a prayer partner and find a particular uh, issue to bring before God. And for 30 days, they would get together and pray about it. Now, it's kind of hard to do that in social uh, social distancing. However, we are getting together right now. So uh, I'm just going to ask all of us uh, who can hear my voice to find a prayer, prayer partner. We'll find one right here online uh, and get together with them and pick a, a, a topic that you want to pray about and go to God with it. You don't have to be for a half hour, for an hour, but get together and uh, pray, bring it before God because the, the prayers of a righteous man. 
So if you get together with someone. Verses 14 through 24. And as we're reading, I would like you to keep this verse in mind. John 17, verse 20. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in you. Amen. So, Jesus that same prayer for us. Now, uh, before we begin reading, we're going to do a little background. So if you have your books, please join me in the background. On page 248. And again, it reads, the prayer in Matthew 6, 9 through 13 is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. However, that prayer is actually a model for the prayers of believers. The true Lord's Prayer is the prayer of John 17. This is Jesus' farewell prayer for his disciples. In the prayer of Matthew 6, Jesus explains what his disciples should desire for themselves. In the prayer of John 17, Jesus petitions God on behalf of his disciples. Jesus and his disciples had just finished eating the Passover meal. And Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he uh, would should depart out of this world unto the Father. Now Jesus gave the disciples their final instructions. He told them of the coming betrayal, going to the Father to prepare a place for them, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. After completing his final teaching, after completing his final teaching, called the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus offered up his longest recorded prayer called the High Priestly Prayer. That's what I was talking about, our high priest. He is our intercessor. The prayer was likely prayed in the presence of the disciples, either in the Upper Room or on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, if you could only give one last prayer for your children, or another group you lead, what would you pray for them? Peace. Peace. Peace and prosperity. I pray for salvation and, and freedom. Whatever it is that finds us. So, um, we're going to start uh, reading chapter 17. We'll begin by reading verses 14 through 16. I have given them your word, and the word hates them because they do not belong in to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not give, asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Amen. Jesus said that these people that he was praying for, his disciples, did not belong to this world any more than he does. Think about that. We are not really citizens of this world. We have a kingdom that this world has not seen. We're just visiting here. And we are going to our kingdom, and we will be with our king, Jesus, and we shall serve God for eternity. Amen. So uh, we're going to read the end of and if you have your books, please join with me on page 248 under the heading, The Believer's Protection. In this final prayer before his passion, Jesus petitions God for his followers. The Lord realizes that his earthly ministry is drawing to an end. Soon he will return to his rightful place in heaven. So he commits his followers to Father's care. Jesus affirms that he has completed part of his mission already. He has given the disciple the Father's word. 
Jesus himself is the word of God. By his teaching, preaching, and his holy presence, he has imparted the Father's word to his followers. Although believers are separated from the world, Christ does not expect us to withdraw from the world. Instead, he asks that we be protected from the world's evil influences. The evil one is Satan, the devil, who always seeks to drag people away from God. Though the disciples will be in the world, they belong elsewhere, namely heaven. Just like Jesus himself, their allegiance and citizenship has changed to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Citizens of heaven. Heavenly citizens. Jesus uh, commanded us to be in the world, but not of the world. We have to walk around in this world, but we cannot become a part of it. Um, on Wednesday, uh, Bishop was, he, he emphasized the uh, being transformed by the renewing of your mind and how we have to be, but not be conformed to the ways of this world, Romans 12.2. Uh, but it talks about how we're in this world, but we're not a part of this world. We are a part of a, a high citizenship, something that this world has not seen. And I don't know what we'll be like, but when he comes back, we will be like him. Amen. So, uh, we are going to continue reading chapter 17, verses 17 through 19. And it reads, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice to them so that they can be made holy by your truth. Amen. So now we will uh, go into the end up on page 249 under the second heading, The Believer's Sanctification. And just so you know, sanctification, well, actually the text is going to describe what the word sanctification Jesus' second petition is for sanctif sanctification. Sanctify them through thy truth. To sanctify means to set apart for God and his holy purposes. Every believer has been set apart to carry on the work of Christ. Each Christian has been appointed some divine task and equipped to carry it out. God sent Jesus with a specific mission to enlighten all humanity that involved a great deal of courage, prayer, and self-sacrifice. This is exactly what he expects from us, exactly what he has prepared and, perfect and personally sanctified us for. Jesus set himself aside from all defilement and resisted all temptation so that he could successfully carry out his spiritual responsibility. He did this so that others might be sanctified through the truth. The truth is God's active word, word that must be obeyed. Jesus in his incarnation was God's truth personified. And all his followers need the truth and abide in it. For their sake, he has consecrated himself as a living sacrifice and stood in the gap on our behalf. Have you sanctified yourself to God's purpose? How do you manifest that promise in everyday life? I think I'll let you answer that one first. Uh, well, I manifested the promise in God's everyday life because I pray um, before uh, I go to work um, every day. I work at home, but I do open my Bible around 7.30 and I read a scripture and that scripture stays with me um, through the day. And I think about what it means to me and how God has, how God is always with me and helps me. Amen. Um, it's hard to sanctify yourself um, for a special purpose for Christ, for God. Uh, currently, I'm in the middle of a, I'm in the middle of a fast, and it's, it, you have to it seems like sanctify yourself over and over because the world comes at us in every direction. The flesh speaks to us, and we're supposed to be citizens of a, of a higher kingdom. Yet, we're living in this world that uh, bombards our 
our senses. And uh, we're constantly forgetting about Christ. I was listening to T.T. Jakes this morning, and he said, the church has forgot about Jesus. He stands at the door and knocks. Didn't even realize he wasn't in here. And our life is like that sometimes. Uh, we go about our daily life like, oh, I am a Christian. I am, look at that man over there. And we forget that we are just like him. You know, and we're supposed to be special and set aside for his purposes. And sometimes we tend to forget it. So daily, I have to remind myself that I am a child of the Most High God, and Jesus is my King. And that's the way that we sanctify ourselves with daily reminders that I am here for a special purpose. I'm not just some guy. I am a child of God. Amen. So we're going to continue. We're going to conclude our reading of reading verses 20 through 24. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, as just as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, that you have them, that you love them as much as you love me. That is a mighty statement. That you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see the, all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Amen. I often include, almost always include that in my prayer. When I pray to the Father, Father, I pray that I may be one with you as Christ is one with you. I, I keep that in my prayer because it is hard to remember who we are and that we should be one with Christ. That we are sanctified, set aside for a special purpose. So uh, we're going to uh, finish the in-depth on page 249 under the third heading, The Believers. The Believers' Sanctification. Jesus' second petition. The Believers' Unity. This prayer can be summed up as a desire for a unity that would be mimic the unity that Jesus has with the Father. Up to this point, Jesus has focused his prayer primarily on his disciples. Now, he looks to the future and prays for the universal church throughout the ages. The Father and Son provide the best example of Christianity unity. Christians will find themselves united with each other as they unite with Christ. The glory of Christ unites Christians with him. Our common salvation unites us one and serves as a sign to the word that Christ came from God and lives with us. Jesus asked the unity of the believers would show the world that Jesus was sent by the Father and would cause the world to believe in him as a savior. All believers should join with Christ in praying that God be glorified and that believers everywhere be sanctified and unified. The question poses, how has a lack of unity in the church contributed to why the world has not been in the midst of God? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, well, I believe that the reason the lack of unity in the church um, contributes to the way that the world is and, and not uh, and not be, not following Christ is because, like I said, sometimes they don't even see Christ in the church. So if they don't see Christ in us, Christians, then why should they believe in Christ? If we are walking as Christ and living as Christ, then they should will be convinced of Christ. But if they see us claiming Christ but acting like Satan, that's what they're going to believe in. So unity in the church in the world. So uh, I would like to thank you for joining us today and uh, I hope that you join us next week as we study prophesying daughters. Amen.
So we're going to end today's lesson as we begin, as we end each day in a word of prayer. Father God, we call upon you in the name of our Savior Christ Jesus, our intercessor. Thanking you, Lord God, for this opportunity to be close to you, Father God, to hear your word, Lord. Lord, I pray that you dwell in us, Father God, each day, and that we walk around, Father God, communicating with you through our intercessor. We pray that you lead us by the Holy Spirit, Father God, into this world to do the work that you have sent us to do. We give you honor, glory, and praise by faith in the matchless name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Again, I'd like to thank you for joining us for Cyber Sunday School at Mount Calvary Community Church, the biggest little church in Omaha. And until we see you next week, be blessed. Be blessed.